this meeting. Sorry, something had to zoom. Okay. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Applications like Robin Hood are no better than gambling. They are basically like a poker machine on your phone, which causes thousands to lose their money, their life savings, causes thousands to go into states of depression, and causes thousands to be unable to support themselves economically. We would prefer that the rise never happened, and we prefer people invested in much safer alternatives. Three points in this speech. Firstly, why, we, why the alternatives are better than these sort of applications. Secondly, why these applications are likely to fail. And thirdly, why they're bad for the economy as a whole. But quickly on setup, the first thing I'd like to say here is like, what do we mean by the rise? We think that these sort of applications have existed for you know five to 10 years, but they're becoming increasingly popular, which means that people are choosing to use these sort of applications rather than things like managed funds, which contain thousands of different stocks, things like investing into their retirement or things like using stockbrokers. And then the other important thing to note in setup is, you know, who do we think these people are that are increasingly choosing to use these kind of things? We think it's mostly young people because they buy into the whole mindset mindset they're much more likely to base their decisions on things they see on the internet like wall street bets compared to older people now onto the first point of substantive here but why we think alternatives are good as they flagged and set up we think the counterfactual in this world is using more things like managed funds um rather than these sort of applications we don't think that people are likely to just put their money into bank accounts because they don't return very well to really bad investment so what, why do we, um, so why do we think that these are likely to do better? We think they return better fees, they are relatively safe and they give you good returns. Why is this the case? Firstly, because there is a large amount of competition in this industry. So this is for itself for two reasons. Firstly, because they're seen as lucrative investments for companies that manage them. This is because these companies get a percentage of the return rather than a flat fee. So they are much more likely to manage it well, try to maximize your individual profits. But the second thing to say here is that even if those institutions themselves don't make a lot of profit off your money, having it gives them a huge amount of market power because they can invest in it, in other things. So like having even 1% of normal investments in the market gives you the power to literally change the price of product. Therefore, you can use these managed funds as loss leaders, which means that there are a lot of these companies that manage investments, that do it well. There's lots of competition. This means they need to compete in things like returns with low fees, like providing ethical options for individuals. What does this mean? It means that individuals can pick the option that best suits them. The second thing to say here is that institutions, these kind of institutions are set up to give advice. They like to make themselves easy to understand by um, individuals. They have the legal capability to do so. So, you know, if I go to a, say, stockbroker and I say, I want to, you know, invest in this index, they will say, you know, you're young. That's probably a bad investment for you. Have a look at these alternatives. Know that Robinhood just does not have the legal framework to be able to do this. They can't at all assist you. So therefore we think that we support much better alternatives on the outside. But this leads me to the second point of substantive on why these sort of applications are likely to fail and fuck up your money. The, the thing to say here is that people just don't pick the things to invest in very well. Because firstly, even if you have a finance degree, you're well intelligent, you think you know a lot about the market, Picking individual stocks is a random activity. Look, a bunch of random walk experiments that have have gotten better results than like stock brokers and people from Wall Street. I'm sorry, not stock brokers, like people from Wall Street, sorry. So um, the um, like intuition pump behind this point of why, you know, it's just so random is think about people that spend their whole lives like and researching into horses, studying them, learning their strengths and weaknesses. They still are unable to make profit on things like horse races because it is a random activity. Um, you know, choosing which stocks to invest in is no better than playing on a pinball, uh, a pinball machine. But the second thing to say here is that people, even if you believe, like, um, even like in a more realistic case, it's much worse than people that have a finance degree because people, firstly, have a real lack of knowledge of this. So like, you know, people don't read through the financial statements of businesses and like commodities simply because there's just so much information of it. You're not a supercomputer. You can't process it all. So when you do make investments, you're much more likely to think, oh, wow, Apple released a really cool iPhone that I really like. They're about to go up. I'll invest in them. But you don't know, you know, that the price of silicon is increasing, that, you know, there was another phone that is actually about to do much better on the market, that there is a problem in the supply chain, like four steps down, which means that, you know, it's likely that that thing you invested in is about to massively go down. The second thing to say is also that people just don't act ra rationally. Why is this? Well, firstly, this app, these applications just 
feel a lot like gambling. They advertise with cool colors. They seem really like cool and savvy. They play into the whole, oh, you can beat the bastards on Wall Street kind of mindset. But the second thing to say here is that the people that use them are the type of people that A, either, you know, have enough money that they want to invest, but don't have enough to invest in something like a house. So they're willing to, you know, take risks in order to get that money back. Or B, they want money really fast just because they need returns or they're comparing with their friends in like a competitive sort of mindset. And then the third thing to say under this point is that these apps are often seen as like a reflection of your intelligence. It plays into a competitive mindset that how well you're able to make returns is like how intelligent and how financially savvy you are. What does this mean? It means that people are willing to make risky decisions and not to make diverse investments for that chance that they make massive returns. So this just means that in most cases, you are not going to make any returns, you're going to piss away your earnings at best case, um, and you're probably likely to end up in a much worse financial position than you started off in. What does this mean? Firstly, it means that you're likely to just, you know, lose a lot of money, which means you can't invest in things that set you up for a stable life. You can't invest in a house. In order to buy a car, you might need to take a much more risky loan or invest in a dodgy secondhand car that's going to fail in five years time anyway. We think that this leads to huge impacts down the track that don't just affect that individual that, you know, chose to use that application in the first place, but affects your future family. You can't provide the same for your children, for your grandparents, and they want to go into a nursing home. The second impact here is that sometimes you just lose so much money that it causes massive depression, causes people to commit things like self-harm, to commit suicide. Whilst it seems extreme, and whilst we admit that this is not, you know, super common, it does happen, and those times it happens, it's just so terrible that we should care about these people so much it's probably the most vulnerable the people with the least amount of education and the people that needed the money the most or were most willing to take risks the third point of this speech is about how this harms the whole economy this kind of um the rise of these applications changes the incentives for companies why because firstly they want to appeal to the state to prestige and create a cult of followers. They want to attempt to appear like Elon Musk. They want to seem cool, hip and up and coming in the way that Tesla was able to do. What does this mean? It means that they're likely to stop focusing on things that actually make profitability, like, you know, making good products, making, you know, a good working car, but instead generate like a weird cult, follow, cult personality that people look up to, you know, spend all their time on Twitter to appeal to young people and make themselves seem relevant and important. This means you get less good products. This is a real harm in the market. The second thing here, it leads to a real increase of like things like pump and dump. So what does this mean? It means, you know, a lot of people buy into the company and rapidly, so if somebody buys into the company, which rapidly inflates the stock price. But by, this is by just being really short term and lying, you know, going onto Wall Street bets and telling people to invest in your company because it's about to go up. This causes an artificial rise in the stock price. But then the person that, you know, artificially caused that rise withdraws first, which causes, you know, a bunch of other people to withdraw. But sadly, some people are not fast enough to withdraw their money from that investment. They lose millions. They, use, they lose their life savings or because somebody tried to manipulate the stock market using these sort of apps. The third thing to say here is that what we defend in other investments look to much more long-term returns. They're much more likely to invest in things that are going to do good in society, i.e. be a good car, not just be a you know, trendy car, which means we do much better things under our side. So proud to affirm. All right, thank you. Hello, please. Hi, can I be heard? <laughs> yep, you're good. Okay, just give me five seconds. I'll start. Um, starting in three, two, one. So piece of framing on what we think this debate looks like on off. Firstly, insofar as more 
platform insofar as we are, we are defending a rise of retail investments we're also probably likely to defend a rise in the platforms that you can do retail investment in which is to say that you are probably going to have more platforms like zeroda and grow that are easier to like to be able to do this investment what this means is two things right number one obviously if you have more platforms that means that there's demand in the market to have more information on how to invest in these platforms we think this is likely to be true because one there's already a trend to give people these information uh, this information particularly through things like more understand like more understanding of graphs explainer videos on youtube more in understanding financial com com financial commentary etc but i think the second thing that's true is that obviously individuals want i mean like institutions want money through like retail investment which is why they need to make it palatable for individuals to want to invest in them i think the second thing i want to make clear is that it, you require lower amounts to do retail investment which is to say it is easier to buy smaller stocks because individuals understand like institutions understand that you have a lower financial capacity on their side they absolutely need to defend a world where you need to have massive amounts of money to be able to do things like manage funds in the first place but i think the third thing I want to make clear is that obviously like risky investments like robin hood aren't indicative of like larger trends in re retail investment we think this is particularly true because it's unlikely you're going to get collective buy in for things like frustration or on a company that just wants you to invest in a company particularly because you just generally think that the company is bad which is to say that we don't defend the worst sort of risky investments on our side of the house i want to make like one thing super super clear about the counterfactual before i move into substantive i think the thing that they defend is managed funds which is particularly bad for two sets of reasons right number one i think they needed to show you why specifically and exclusively not having retail investment makes these managed funds better which is to say that perhaps in, like on our side of the house we still get to defend having mutual funds having invest, uh, investors invest in these mutual funds they exclusively needed to show you why this is the only thing that the market needs and this exclusively becomes better when you curb retail investment but i think the second thing i want to point out is that a lot of their benefits in general are inexclusive which is to say that even in retail investment you probably still want to diversify yourself this is more likely to be true because you know only your Your money hedges on that diversification, hedges on the ways in which you invest. The third thing I want to make clear is that it. they absolutely also need to defend a world where managed funds themselves are unstable this is true for three reasons number one i think just mutual funds have competing incentives which is to say that you're competing with another mutual fund manager therefore you have an incentive to make more unstable investments particularly because you want to be the mutual fund that earns the most out of your investments i think the second thing that's true is that you have less transparency as an individual investing in the managed fund because these mutual funds don't owe you shit there are a bunch of investors in them which is why they're less likely to have transparency in the ways in which they invest which means you in general exercise this agency over your investments i think the third thing that's true is that all mutual funds prioritize different goals which is to say that perhaps an individual doesn't necessarily want retirement benefits maybe they want to decide the ways in which they want to make money that's obviously only possible when you have retail investment but the last thing i want to make clear about that counterfactual is that obviously it cannot ever be limited to managed funds particularly because these are these are funds with higher barriers of entry you already need to know a lot in the market to invest in this in the first place which one just preemptively takes out a lot of their harms of knowing a lot about the market but two shows that they need to defend a world you invest in things like real estate as well this is particularly bad because one these are industries that are unlikely to be regulated because these are voting issues which means that the money that you invest in these in these industries are more likely to be risky but two i think you're like you're less likely to want to hedge your bet your bets particularly because you need a lot of money to even make these like make these investments in the first place which is why it's unlikely that a lot of people can opt into this uh, thirdly um i think that probably it's also likely that because a lot of the the counterfactuals require a lot of money people are going to go to like bank lend, uh, bank savings which is why they also need to defend a world where people don't make any money at all three things then in the speech firstly why access to markets are important secondly why indiv like institution i mean retail investors are likely to do this in good ways and thirdly why their investing strategies are the best way to stabilize the market why do you think access to markets is important there are two ways in which i'm going to make this argument the first is to show you that we have a lower barrier to investment i think this is particularly true because like apps require less downloading you need like less amounts of information to even be able to download this app as opposed to the counterfactual in this other house where i don't know you call up a broker you decide to invest in a mutual fund etc but then the second thing that's true is that we get more platforms in our side of the house this is particularly true partic uh, because like startups know that there's a demand in the market for being able to make these platforms in general i think what this means is that it's easier to exploit market inefficiency which is to say that you don't need to wait till you call a broker you don't need to wait till your mutual fund decides to invest in a stock that you see is going down in the stock 
stock that you see is rising, you can make those choices yourself, which means you make faster choices and therefore are able to make better, like more amounts of money. I think the reason that access is important is threefold. Number one, it's just more formalization in investment, particularly because you have only retail, uh, because you have retail investment. This is true, one, because I think that the trend in post-COVID economies to just want people to invest more in, in, to want people to invest more in retail investment, which is why you have an incentive as a government to regulate this. But I think the second thing that's true is that individuals just need to disclose money, uh, need to disclose income, need to disclose the ways in which they're investing in the market, particularly because it is uh, because it is seen as a risky investment, which is why you're more likely to have information about individuals that are like investing in the first place that in general is a good impact for an economy. I think the second thing that's true is that you're able to balance income gaps way more, which is to say on their side of the house, the people that are be being able to make the best sort of investments are obviously likely to be people with the most amount of money, which is why it's particularly bad because you increase the income gap, i.e. the privileged make more money and the underprivileged don't. I think on our side of the house, especially one, because we've told you in framing that you need smaller amounts of money to do this, but two, particularly because if you have like you have more amounts of information because you have more things like exp explainer videos, which is why you're more likely to be able to make a good investment and make money out of that. I think the third thing I want to make clear is that individuals do make gains. This is particularly true because I think you can you don't have to invest in always like Fortune 500s or, app, or the apples of the world. I think you have more local information about local factories that exist in your in and around your vicinity. So you can see a factory implementing a new like new technology and therefore want to invest in it. I think this argument preemptively shows you what there's a likelihood of income of individuals investing in the right ways and that access in and of itself is a priori good, which is why you ought to wait about content you've heard from apps. Why do we think individuals are likely to do this in a good way, right? There are three ways in which I'm gonna make the argument of individuals not investing, like of being able to stop the worst kinds of losses. The first is just stop losses, which is to say that when like a stock is falling, you as an in retail investor have the ability to say, if it falls by 10%, I want you to take my money out of the market and sell it, which is to say that you li limit the worst sort of losses because you can just set a limit for when you're okay with taking a loss and when you're not. But I think the second thing that's true is that there are likely to be things like circuit breakers. This literally exists in every like stock market around the world where you have individuals that stop trading or prevent like panic selling on a stock at the point in which the stock is falling, which is which is to say that these institutions already exist to curb the worst sort of losses for individuals. But I think the third thing that's true is that you have forums as retail investors where you're able to discuss the likelihood of a stock falling or investment being good, which is particularly true, like which is means that you get more information on our side of the house, which curbs the worst sort of harm. The two other things that I want to note is just one, institutional investors are hugely competitive on their side of the house because stock market is often a zero-sum game. At that point, a lot of individual, a lot of mutual funds are likely to follow these institutional investors, which means that you make less money on their side of the, on their side of the house because these institutional investors are the ones that are making the most out of money because these are the ones investing the most money in the market. But I think the second thing that's true is that you get uh, like you, I mean, uh, on our side, you're count like uh, alternatively able to research when investments are likely to be good and when they're bad, which is to say that you have options like shorting when you realize that in an institutional an investor has fucked up in the market, which is why you're more likely to be able to make the best sort of decisions on our side of the house. Just on trade-off wise, like risk likely to be good. Two things I want to note. Number one, I think you just increase competition among companies because these are the ones that want the most amount of money from retail investors. But I think the second thing that's true is that insofar as we prevent the worst damages, you ought to weigh our material higher than theirs because we just show that gains are likely to be larger for individuals through this market. Why do we think investing strategies are likely to be good? One, I think there's likely to be just more democratization, which is to say that individual institutions have purpose and Incentives, we obviously curb this by balancing out more individuals in, in investing in the market, which is why it's hard for like a few bunch, a, a bunch of investors to take huge advantage of the market. But I think the second thing that's true is that we're, like these individuals are more affected by real world situations, which is why they're likely to invest in companies that are closer to them for all these reasons you ought to negate. All right, thank you very much, DPM. I'm um, just confirming that I can be seen and heard. Yep. Easy. All right, starting my speech in three, two, one. Nothing in that speech addresses the problems that we give you at Louise as to why people cannot consent to using their, these apps and their rise has led to an even lessened ability to, to consent to them because these apps engage in more marketing now. They engage in social integration with things like Wall Street bet bets and they prey upon people who are trying to save up for a house and know that it is difficult to do that in these economic conditions. They prey upon people who want something to prove that they are smart or as smart as the guys on Wall Street and they prey upon 
people who cannot afford to lose this money, but do not have the tools to use these apps effectively, because Robinhood doesn't care if you make a profit or a loss. What it actually cares about is how many trades you make, because that is where it makes its money, is on how many trades you make. It has an active incentive to stop you from doing something sensible, like holding onto a stock for the medium term. It wants you to be constantly trading, to be filled with anxiety so that you're changing your decision all the time. And that is why people cannot consent and why they never make money off of these apps also. So let's talk about what these apps looks like, look like and why their existence is so coercive to the people that use them. The first thing is just the way that the marketing works. They are entirely unregulated. I would su suggest that the fact that we, th we th think, think things like advertising poker machines or advertising gambling on horse races is usually pretty bad, suggests that this is also quite a powerful and negative way for these apps to coerce people into using them. Because the marketing often looks like things exactly like pyramid schemes. It looks like telling people this is a way that you can get rich quick if you're smart and who doesn't think that they're smart, right? Like when you have that kind of qualifier, it just sucks people in. They think that by using this app and by making money, they prove their intelligence, they prove their worthiness, but also the communities that they create are incredibly toxic because they buy into that exact form of marketing. Stuff like Wall Street Bets relies on these ideas of like intelligence and toughness and bravery. It's like the idea that you would be so brave that you would buy like a random stock that nobody's heard of like fucking GameStop, which makes no economic sense at all. But you're like proving your toughness, you're proving your masculinity masculinity often by buying it and holding it across these pump schemes. And then because you're suckered in by that mentality, you lose all the money when they dump. That is incredibly destructive and it hurts a lot of people. That's why you see things like some people who lose so much money on Robin Hood doing things like committing suicide or falling into states of mental illness in the exact same way that problem gamblers do. It is entirely the same. The third thing to suggest though, is that everything that they give you around, in, around the information that you might be able to access is just not enough. Like you can spend all of your time investigating horse racing or investigating the algorithms on poker machines or investigating all sorts of crap, but you do not have the tools to invest. And this is the same. The other thing to note here is that people who are using retail investment are not day traders. This is not their job. They cannot sit at home for eight hours a day reading through financial statements. Instead, they have an hour or two in the evening that they maybe spend on researching these things. That research probably looks like going on to Wall Street bets for most of these people, or it looks like going on to YouTube or taking advice from strangers on the internet who probably don't know any better than them, but are just trying to prove a point or trying to look smart or get likes on Reddit or upvotes on Reddit, whatever the fuck it is. So that is incredibly bad and incredibly destructive, but also a lot of the information that they suggest themselves is not enough to make a good decision. Seeing a factory grow up, grow up in your neighborhood and thinking, oh man, Tesla's building cars here. That must mean that they're about to make heaps of money is not enough because it doesn't tell you anything about their competitors, right? It's not enough to know one company is going to do something that might make them money. You have to know about how that is relative to their competitors. You need to understand the whole industry because of course it's fine for Tesla to do something good, but if Toyota does something much better, people will buy Toyota prop stocks instead of Tesla stocks and you will lose money on your Tesla stocks because Tesla is not competitive in that market. So it is not enough to just understand one company or five companies. You need to understand the entire industry and then you need to compare it to a bunch of other other investment options. It is not possible. That is why Wall Street brokers usually don't do very good compared to things like hamsters or monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard. So you cannot do this. It is just gambling, but it is a particularly coercive, particularly negative form of gambling. And often it is manipulated to deliberately make people lose money, like things like pump and dump schemes, which we tell you at Louise mean that the most vulnerable actors, the people with the least information get suckered in. It is just a scam. They lose all their money. And that is incredibly destructive for those people. That's it. Let's then talk about the only other mechanism that they give you, which is the idea that maybe competition means that these apps get better. We already tell you that it doesn't matter how good they are. There is just no information that allows an ordinary retail investor to make a sensitive, a sensible decision on a single stock. And of course, their mechanism here is pretty speculative, but also they compete on more. If they do compete, they probably compete on much worse things. What they are probably competing on is not how can we best deliver financial statements to consumers or can, how can we compress those because people don't want to read that crap. What they do want for the most part is things like social integration, things like effects on the app that celebrate when you win and punish you when you lose, things like the way that lights work. Again, this is so similar to poker machines. It is actually insane. Those things are incredibly evil. They prey upon a bunch of things in our brain chemistry that just go off and give us dopamine when we get a good effect or when the app makes a happy noise when we make money or a sad noise when we lose. And that suckers people into using them. You don't want to give it up. And of course, you try to chase your losses in the exact same way that gamblers do. 
And of course, the final thing that you do is that the loss, the, the kind of like recognition of loss and getting out that they speak, speak about is actually a bad behavior and usually an irrational one. Because often what people do is they get into this on the promise of easy money for smart people. Then they see that their investment has gone down by 2% one day. They see the red line and the unhappy effect on the app and they freak out because they realize that they didn't predict that. That's not what they thought was ha gonna happen. They thought it was just gonna go up. They get incredibly stressed out and they sell off really quickly, which is a terrible way to make your investment decisions. It looks like people just buying stock as soon as they drop, freaking out, eating a small loss and repeating that process a number of times, which just loses you money in the end. Because people don't have the tools to behave rationally on these apps. And they are often suckered into behaving irrationally in a very deliberate way to maximize things like transactions that they do. They we tell you that there are a number of better options. They give you very confusing reasons as to why those things are not better. The important thing to understand here is that their arguments just aren't grounded in reality. There are very low barriers to entry, or at least barriers that are low enough that these people who use apps like Robinhood can jump over them when it comes to something like a managed fund. If you're that invested in the stock market and you're spending every hour, you're spending your hours reading about company financial statements, you probably know about things like Vanguard index funds, which only require a $5,000 initial investment. You probably know about things like the fact that almost Every single bank offers you the option to do things like buy into managed funds. I buy into managed funds. Most of my friends do the same thing on various apps. It's incredibly easy, but also much safer because those managed funds track thousands of stocks. And you can certainly make a broad generalization that usually the market goes up most years. That's quite safe, but tracking a single stock is extremely volatile because those stocks bounce around like crazy or might be subject to something like a pump and dump scheme, which just destroys them. There are all sorts of things that are really bad. Almost everyone in the world has some form of pension or some form of retirement income that you can contribute to. That is another really good one that people might do. And even if our burden is just to say, if this rise did not happen, some people would let their money sit in their savings account. That is so much better because letting your money sit in your savings account isn't addictive and it also will not lose you money. It just means that it is not growing. That's fine. So all of their material about the income gap is actually worse on their side because it is the more vulnerable actors that just go onto Reddit, onto Robinhood, onto Wall Street bets, think that seeing a factory is enough to make a sensible investment decision and then lose their money. That is incredibly destructive and incredibly bad. Whereas people seeking out alternatives like those managed funds are so much better. They are the only sensible way. And if you ask anybody who has studied a finance degree, they will almost always tell you buying a stock is a bad idea. You should just track the entire index, track the entire market. And that is the only sensible thing to do with your money. I think that if people with finance degrees are saying this, and I think that if any intuitive person who can look at a community like, like Wall Street Bets can look at a community like investment Twitter and realize that it is filled with guys who talk about being Sigma males, who talk about being on the grind set and who clearly don't know anything about the entire industries that they're investing in. But just think that because some dude with a funky username on Reddit told them that the stock was going to go up, that's a sensible investment decision. Those people are you know, annoying, but they are people we should still care about and they're losing their money on their side. Rises in things like this are incredibly destructive. And for that reason, we are proud to oppose. Okay, thank you. Yellow, please. Hi, can I confirm that I'm audible? Yeah. All right. Just setting up my timer. Okay. All right, starting my speech in three, two, one, go. There are two reasons why side affirmative loses the debate today. One is that this theme has a tendency to conveniently shift context, which is to say on one hand, retail investors on their side apparently have very good information to choose between mutual funds, which they never supply any proof of why they have good incentives or any incentive to act in good manners. But on our side, all of them are just a bunch of random fools who don't know what to do. And hence, like all of their impacts end up accruing as a result of that. Right. But the second thing is that I think they just never give you enough reasons as to why the counterfactual on their side is likely to be 
be any better. Which is to say, at the end of two speeches, at best, what they've been able to do is tell you there are a bunch of harms with regards to retail investing that ever proving a counterfactual of why these things end up becoming better. I don't know why, like quote unquote, managed funds are better. But I also think that they shirk their burden as a counterfactual, right? In order to defend a world of managed funds, they had to defend you as to why people don't put their money into other risky investments such as real estate as well, to the extent to which they have more money to invest, which means that at best, even if you buy all their arguments about managed funds, they have never done the likelihood analysis of why that's the largest part of the debate, which means they affect a very, very small part of the debate at the end of the day. I'm going to be clashing with them on largely uh, two issues and then moving on to one piece of like extension, right? The first is with regards to like where are like where are investment strategies better for retail investors, right? Is it the case that these retail investments are just based on trends and fads or are they likely to be more strategic and reasonable as we characterize at the end of first negative, right? They give you a few reasons as to why these are just going to be like absolutely horrible, right? The first thing they say is that these industries are entirely unregulated. Two responses to this. One, it's there's literally no proof supplied with, at, the, at the end of two speeches as to why this is unregulated. In fact, secondly, I would posit there's an active incentive for these things to be regulated, right? Which is to say, to the extent to which governments have voter bank incentives, they don't want people to lose their money, but lose their money. But secondly, governments also don't want people to put their money into like, I don't know, like like uh, informal sectors or something like that, right? I think Aina gives you a reasoning for why the my point at which reason Retail investors invest more money into the stock market. Money goes into formalized sectors where you can track the money and make it where it can directly go into companies. Which is why governments in general have an incentive to regulate these sorts of markets so that people feel there is a greater sense of trust in these industries anyway, right? But I think like it's just generally this, right? There is more regulation is generally possible because these companies also themselves want to seem trustworthy, right? Which is to say, if all the analysis at the end of two speeches is true, what they prove is that this market is currently only uh, like exclusive to a certain dude bros who study finance. I, I don't know and like hop onto Reddit, right? You want to expand this market more and more. The way to do that is through regulation. Otherwise, more people don't end up investing, right? Which is why I think there's an organic incentives for regulation to exist. I think what this argument does is it proves to you as to why, even if you regret it, like, like regret some parts of the industry, there is possibility for change. They needed to prove absolute blanket ban removal of this, which they haven't done, right? But the next reason they supply for why this is bad is that it, it is likely to prey on your biases in terms of like get rich fast and all those sorts of things. Three responses. One, uh, it says, this is a sim, like if you're, Doing worst case debating, this is just symmetric, right? Which is to say that like uh, mutual funds also do the same thing. They tell you that you put your money into my scheme and you will get rich quick. And people often have very little understanding of like how these mutual funds or managed funds do end up working for the same reasons that they supply probably, right? Which means that at, if they want to do work is debating, their harm is symmetric. But secondly, right, uh, their impact that flows out of this is also non-mutually exclusive. They say the impact is that, oh, people are coerced into these sorts of investing, which is ob obviously bad. Like, I don't know why people aren't coerced into investing into new managed funds on their side of the house, right? It is, I would posit it is more the case that people are coerced on their side because they have literally only one option if all of their analysis is true, which is to put their money into these sorts of schemes. On our side, just note, right, we can literally co-opt their counterfactual as well, right? Although there is a rise in retail investing, if certain investors feel like it's not not good enough. There's literally no compulsion, right? Like you literally put your money into mutual funds, which means they, we co-opt their comparative of why you can have other sorts of things, which means it's less coercive on our side. But thirdly, I would posit it's actively not like a poker machine as they emphasize like 10 times in their speech, right? The reason for this is that you have the ability to feel real world effects of your investment or, like uh, on an everyday basis. This is not like a poker world, like, like Vegas, where everything's closed off. You can't see anything outside. You're know, completely immersed into this, right? You can see the fact that you don't have money for rent. You can see the fact that your children aren't able to go to school or like you have to drop out school because you wouldn't pay fees, etc. Right? These are real world impacts that in retail investors feel the most because they're the ones who often are vulnerable to things like, like losses of income, etc. Which is why there's an organic incentive for these individuals to not do all these sorts of things. But the next thing they say is that uh, why this uh, investment only bad is that you just take advice from strangers on the internet and as a result of that like uh, like you just do bad investment right a few few reasons as to why this is untrue right the one the first is that i think our analysis for why i think these platforms themselves have an organic incentive to provide you more information is unresponded to for and it is quite devastating for them right because i think the analysis is this to the extent to which more and more people on this platform are losing money less and less people use your platform which is why investors of things like Robin or like all these other apps have an organic incentive to provide you more information because that's the way in which you attract more customers because otherwise people just lose their money and you can't make more trades, you can't make more money, all those sorts of things, right? Which is why automatically you provide more information, right? But secondly, I think it is more likely to be the case that people rely on strangers on their side, right? Which is to say, to the extent to which people don't understand things like mutual funds, they're more likely to rely, or like, like these managed funds, etc. They're more likely to rely on strangers because they just can't make a decision for themselves. On our side, people have greater ability to fact check these 
these sorts of things, right? Which is to say, even if the worst case, they end up taking advice from strangers on the internet, they have the ability to Google search and be like, okay, what is this company actually doing? They don't have the ability to do those sorts of things there because like those managed funds are inherently have like very, very like a non-transparent strategies, which means you can't do fact checking on their side, right? But like the final thing they say is that, oh, like people will just follow Elon Musk and they will lose all their money. I think like, like, there needs to be some level of nuance and weighing in this argument, right? One, like there, there, there are competing Elon Musk's in the market, right? Like there are also like other alternate individuals who are rich who probably tell you to invest in something else that Elon Musk doesn't tell you to invest in. But secondly, in general, I think all of our mechanisms with regards to how you have inherent things like circuit breakers in markets, you have inherent things like stop losses in market, literally like take out all the extreme harms they talk about at the end of two speeches. Because we tell you, if the problem is that you don't buy like five, six minutes of my speech, you told you as to why the worst harms can be prevented to the extent to which you can literally said a stop loss which is that i have bought this i have bought the stock i don't have time to look at the market because i have to go to my job but if the stock falls 10 percent, sell the stock i don't want it anymore like like it's literally as simple as that i don't know why like people lose their money and go into depression at the end of all of this right but the second thing i want to look at is just counterfactual right i think the i think the problem with them they never supply any re constructive reasons as to why mutual funds are better right they just say oh they have an incentive to provide you more information because people uh choose and then they won't invest in bubbles right three responses to all of this right Right? One, mutual fund strategies are inherently more risky because you as a mutual fund manager have to compete against other mutual funds managers to get more risk, which is why the investment strategies of these funds is often to generate the most amount of return in the shortest period of time, because that's how more people invest in you and not in a competitor. And that's how you don't lose your job when you when you, when you don't generate enough returns, which is why inherently they have a tendency to be more short termist and more risky, uh, and they never give you any reasons as to why they won't be. But secondly, you as an investor have lesser agency when you invest in mutual funds, etc., because there is lesser transparency. Like when when you invest in a managed fund, the managed fund has no, like like is just legally not required to tell you where they're investing or what smaller smaller choices they're making in an everyday basis. Which is why in general you don't know what's happening, just, and that's bad obviously because you can't check what like there's no inherent check mechanism on where these individuals end up investing. But thirdly, they they are more likely to invest in like certain sectors which are like more systemic to the economy, such as real estate, automobile, etc. Which is to say, if these sectors end up failing, like there's a sectoral risk, and most mutual fund managers lose a lot of their money, which is why you're more prone to things like bubbles. Right? Right? which goes on to show to you as to why on their side of the house, counterfactual is one that's significantly worse and two substantive speeches, there's no mechanism for why that counterfactual is better, right? But on to extension. I think the reason why we are better in terms of economic harms of like the general economy, et cetera, is that I think we have a lesser ability to have bubbles, et cetera, because you have more diversified investment. But two, only on our side can you hold bad companies accountable because retail investors can exclusively like just sell off stocks from company. But third, only on our side can you get money for more minority companies, like, like minority companies, because more minority investors can invest in sort of lot of Hedge funds or like mutual funds have literally no incentive to do that because they always chase return. They're unlikely to reward companies based on the real world impact, which is why we hold companies more accountable on our side for all those reasons, Nikit. All right. Thank you very much. Off with. Just checking I'm both visible and audible. Yep. Starting my speech in three, two, one. This negative team had three bargains. The first was to prove people could consent. The second was that these were actually good for individuals. And the third was that these did not have large externalities that were bad for society. This negative team attempts to do the first of those two questions, which is why I'm gonna spend the vast majority of my speech disproving that. But the question is just, even if you think people can consent, I don't think they prove sufficient harms for the some amount of people that definitely couldn't in our world, even though we think almost no one can consent. And we also prove there's large externalities to this. So even if individuals can consent and they do get a benefit, the harm to the rest of society is something we ought to weigh. And this team has not responded to that material nor explained why they have some other externality benefit. So I think that is enough in a piece of framing. But this speech is going to be as generous as possible and attempt to... Let's first talk about alternatives because there's a lot of like angry shouting in that previous speech about our lack of alternatives. First thing I'll do is prove the likelihood of our alternatives, then second, why they're very good. Then I'll do the consent material, then the stuff about their regulation that they don't really prove and, and those externalities we're talking about. 
So what is the likelihood? They instead say that we have to defend things like banks and real estate. That is true. The problem is we explain that mutual funds are the thing that is most similar to retail funds in that you're looking to retail funds, sorry, to retail investment to get a fair amount of returns fairly aggressively and when you have a low buying. That is what mutual funds provide instead. They also have very low buy-in. As Jordan explains, most banks have their own ones that are directly attached to the bank account you probably already have, which means they're relatively accessible and they are often targeted towards earning decent returns. We'll talk about if they're good or not in a second. So it is the most likely. The second thing is to point out the alternative of, of real estate they also don't prove is particularly likely. So they, they're kind of like, you don't prove it, but you don't prove it either, guys. So it's kind of no different. So I will point out that it's incredibly unlikely you buy into real estate just the upfront costs are very large. So the actor we are talking about here that buys into these apps probably doesn't have the amount of funds. And second, they don't even prove this is harm. Real estate is a generally good investment is relatively safe. Anyway, the second alternative then is around like putting your money in banks. I think Jordan responds to this perfectly fine. This is a safe investment. We don't really care. There's no particular harm here. These people decide to do that rather than mutual funds, noting they have both alternatives. That's perfectly fine. The final response I need to deal with here is they're like, oh, but we also get mutual funds. So people will just opt into those if that is the better alternative for them. The problem is the rise predisposes first that these people actually don't make that decision and are instead deciding to pick into retail investment. But even if that's not the case, the amount of mutual funds that exist will be far less when less people buy into them. And that's for the incentives that Louise explains at first, that mutual funds need to be profitable, which they are less of them will be if there's less people buying into them. And they need to have market power, even if they're not profitable in themselves. Again, something you lose if less people buy into them, which means there will be less mutual funds and less options in mutual funds in their world, even if they exist. But I think very few people opt into them purely on a product of the debate itself. Let's explain why mutual funds are particularly good then, because they do a lot of stuff to be like mutual funds and people are insane. They just want really quick returns. The first thing to point out is they need returns and they need long-term returns because people don't usually work in a mutual fund for like a year and then fuck off again. They often work for a long time. And that is a huge comparative to something like Robinhood, which gets returns off the amount of trades you make. So they don't care if it's profitable or not. At least we need to be profitable in the long term. There's actually incentives why they're likely to want to be profitable in the long term. And that's the first is people aren't just attracted to high returns in mutual funds like the previous speaker asserts because the amount of people that buy into mutual funds is not just the people that we think change in this debate. There's also a whole bunch of like old people that buy into mutual funds, people that are long-termists and family men. Those people want longer term returns. And that means the interests of which ones you buy into are brought down and weighed out under our world, which means their investments are not that silly. But also, if you make large investments, get some money and then move on, and you try and work in another mutual fund or another financial institution, that manager is not going to get another job anyway, because that is a train on their, their uh, investment or rather their reputation, which is the other impact, which is that these institutions often have a reputation, but they don't want to see their uh, mutual funds fail or not make returns at some point. And that means they have an incentive to make relatively smart investments because they do have access to the information these inter individuals don't have. They have things like supercomputers that are able to comprehend them that individuals can't make in retail worlds, but they still, so they are slightly less risk averse, but they still make better investments because they have far more knowledge under that world. And that means they meet the metrics that Louise explains at the start of this speech. They offer low fees because of high competition. They offer good returns, but they do so at a far lower risk. So let's then explain why people can't, re uh, re sorry, can't consent to retail funds because this is their only win condition in the debate. The first thing we point out here is regardless of knowledge, you can't consent because you can't make informed decisions because hamsters already make better investments. They have no response to this material. The second thing we explain is there's just too much information to be able to comprehend. You can't get through it all. We characterize these people as people who are not active day traders, otherwise they'd be doing soft broking themselves, which means they don't have the time to deal with all the information. Even if you did, you don't have the technology. No response to that material. The third thing we explain them is who are these investments and what sort of culture do they buy into? And we explain that these people buy into things like Wall Street Bet. They buy into the fact that their returns are an indication of their intelligence or they like sigma maleness. And they make a series of dumb investments looking for short-termism because these people can't opt into long-term investments or don't want to because they don't have the buy-in to buy something like a piece of real estate. Almost no response to this. The only response we get is to point out that maybe the rise means some older people start to use these apps. That's correct. We're fine. Those people might not 
this mechanism might not refer to them, but this mechanism does refer to the vast majority of people that opt into this. So those people, that mechanism also works on. The fourth is to explain that there's a bunch of advertising and the lack of regulations on these apps. I'll talk about why they can't be regulated in the future, but this is also a debate that exists in the last five, 10 years and regulation will probably take a long time, which means there is a harm that's occurring right now. Maybe they get to resolve it later down the track. We have a definitive clear harm here. The people buy into the kind of gambling mindset that Jordan explains. So their response is insufficient, but they just, even if they can get rid of the advertising, it doesn't matter because they want people to trade lots. It doesn't matter if they make returns on that trade, which means even if they don't have like the really gambly bits of the app, there's still a clear incentive to make them people uh, do lots of different investments. They say that people will opt into local firms. We explain that that means they have no, almost no information and are definitely making bad investments because of that. They then say, well, people actually really care about things like their kids. We first point out that that is an externality that happens too far down the time period, which means you're not going to consider it. And second, that even if you do have kids actively in the status quo, you're unlikely, these people do exist with gambling currently and they fail to take care of their kids because they become addicted or because they are really desperate. Those are still harms that occur and explain why people can't invest, so, or sorry, can't consent. And finally, we explain those pump and dumps in these worlds. So these things are particularly harmful. So there's a series of reasons why people can't consent. I think they have almost no responses to the material and I've offered them anyway. It just means if these people are given the option, they can't make this decision well, and they are often likely to lose an enormous amount of money. But the bigger problem for this negative team is that their benefits are almost entirely resolving on people being able to make these decisions well. The first thing they explain here is you can respond quicker. I don't know why you can respond quicker than Wall Street, but I don't think you can respond at all if you can't process the information. So no benefit there. The second is to say it equals the playing field between the rich and poor. No, it means you actually can't accord, afford to take the loss. And even if you do make that decision, you make it far worse, which means you lose more money than the rich do anyway. So the harm is still there. And the final thing they say is you can like boycott firms. No explanation for why this actor is likely to want to do this. But you can obviously lobby your mutual fund or stop investing merely by buying that funds that sorry that firms in, uh, in sorry product anyway. So that is a way to divest in the status quo. That's perfectly fine. On regulation, they say that voters care about this. We point out that these apps often exist outside of of, of, of individual countries, which means they're incredibly hard to regulate. It takes an incredibly long time. And it's unclear in this team what this regulation even looks like or why we should care. The final thing we do in this debate is explain there's a series of externalities, first to families that are, are, that happen further down the track and that person can no longer look after them. Second, there's a perverse incentive for companies to act for prestige rather than actual profitability in the future to get investments. And second, this is far worse way to allocate uh, income because you no longer get investments in the companies that are actually going to do good things rather the ones that just look fancy and get people's eyes. That explains that there is an externality of this. So even in this negative team's best world where individuals can consent, it's not worth doing. But we definitely don't think they can. They're more likely to lose money, end up in depressive spirals, and not be able to look after their family. Very proud to us. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, up with. Hello, hi. Uh, am I audible? Yep. yep. Let me just set up a timer. Hold on. I'm starting in three, two, one. The problem with side affirmative is that they're uncompetitive. They try to do a likelihood analysis of why their world is better, but I think they just realize that they fall into the same, same traps as, as we do, right? To the extent that even mutual funds need to compete for investment, I don't know why they're only mech for look the, like these apps want more and more people to invest, hence they make it more riskier for them and advertise to them more riskily, don't become symmetric to mutual funds to the extent. Given that mutual funds also just have an incentive to take make money, I don't know if retail investment is not a norm, why do mutual funds don't already do this? I think there is just no response on that on their side of the house and that is like just systemically why they lose the debate. 
but i'll just talk about two things in this uh, in the speech first on where do people invest better i will talk about gambling and the idea of risk here and second where do you have better information on the market but before that just two two pieces of us framing first i'll uh, l- let me just give you reasons on why mutual funds are like is inherently bad if they exist in isolation in the market and if retail investors don't first i think it is just true statistically that more mutual funds have failed than more mutual funds have been successful like i think i think the systemic reason for mutual funds failing is that you have lesser number of people making choices for where your mutual funds should invest which looks like like if their idea is that there is one person with a financial degree who will make better choices the problem with that is simple like if there is one person deciding how like 10000 people investing that in that mutual fund within will invest in that market that just means that you are you are relying too much on the judgment of one person and i think like to the extent that human error is like is like possible and markets are never fully perfect that just means that you are investing in one direction in how that fund manager thinks the reason comparatively retail investment is better and like the thing they've never engaged with is that you just have more opinions in the market which means people are likely to be able to balance each other out i think like they just have no response to it and i think this is just just an irritating tactic right like like unresponsiveness does not mean that your harms don't accrue in this debate right but i think But, but i think then the only meaningful meaningful response they try to give is that look like mutual funds don't compete in a risky manner because they care about long term profit more first i think i uh, first i think it is just untrue to say that right because i think like there are just a lot of examples of mutual funds who want to compete in the short term because i think i i think it is just a competitive advantage for them but the second thing i would i would i would tell you is that like like given the analysis they gave you at first and second speaker in terms of how in long term there is a market growth on net and people just can make more profits by being stable to that extent if long term profit is accessible to everyone i don't know why that is a competitive metric for mutual funds then because because if the idea is that everyone can make long term money then how do mutual funds like are better than one one other right like they just have to defend that mutual funds compare like compete for short term gains because that is literally the point of difference w- between them but the last problem on mutual funds is that if retail investment is not a thing and you want to make mutual funds uh, like system like like symmetrically accessible they also have to create apps for that that, that just means that either they have to li- defend defend limited access for people to mutual funds or they have to run into the same problems of like apps selling mutual funds right so i don't think it was a good strategy on their part but the second thing and i want you to crucially note this right they never respond to our arguments on income gap which is that like their only response is actually a tension in their case they just tell you no like the reason income gap does not go away in our case is because like you know like like people just take on less risk and hence they won't like be able to bridge that income gap so like like think of yourself if that was true that means people aren't stupid like they want to tell you and people don't take more risk but to the extent that their characterization is that people take more risk i think this is the best way to bridge that income gap to that extent i think we have claimed the biggest benefit in this debate which is that like like making economies better in terms of how there is a bridge between like like the richer getting more richer in the market versus how like people with low access to the market have more access and now invest that being said on to the first question then where do people invest better first let me talk about an individual level in terms of why people are an absolutely absolutely trash investors like they want you to claim first i think there are just a lot of balancing forces to bad ones in the market like governments have an active incentive to like run investor awareness programs like financial commentators have an active incentive to try and literate people like like which means that there is just more information in the market i think second is that like in even on individual level these apps compete with each other and hence they have an inherent incentive to go ahead and become better because that is how they com- how they compete with with each other but the third thing to say is that young people aren't just stupid like they want you to tell like like fucking hell i think like more students have more incentive to do research about the market because that is how like like if the idea is that they want to do better than their friends that is how they will be able to do better by like like researching more i don't know why the rational response for a student is just to like gamble on the market and and run it like a poker machine when the when the, this person can do the same competition by like researching and investing better but i think second like they don't respond to the market level risks of this policy right and i and, and i think like like this was very clear as you speech which is that if you invest only in long term stable securities that means you are already investing in sectors which are larger and already like established so you'll probably invest in real estate and like your mutual fund will invest in real estate or in like things like automobile right which means that you as an economy run into systemic risk to the extent that your economy only invests in in some particular things 
the comparative is that retail retail investors just invest in more and more things because there are just more number of people making decisions on where to invest which means on our side you prevent things like the 2008 crisis or the asian economic crisis because you do not have systemic risk in the market that is a huge benefit which they never respond to across three speeches but i think last is that like 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 uh, mutual funds on a comparative on risk just have more risk appetite than individual investors because like a like 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 they have more capital at their disposal which means that they think that they are more likely to be able to absorb risk hence they have more ability to go ahead and make more riskier uh, riskier investment like like the analysis then which you which we give you crucially is that we for we for sure limit the worst kind of risk but we but but like we we and we engage a marginal risk in the economy which i think is crucial to the economy the benefit of this mar- marginal risk being there and being taken up by investors is just twofold which they don't respond to first is that you reduce hegemony in markets of like privileged institutional investors to the extent that you give more access to people from minorities to be invest to be able to invest in the market because rise of retail investing has given ability for more and more people to be able to access market we challenge hegemony better but i think second is that like you just invest in newer and newer products bit, to the extent that you don't have to like always invest in an apple or google for your money to be stable which means that you are more likely to like promote better companies and like mo- like more newer things on our side to that again we hear no response but the last thing i want to talk about in this debate is just information on the market look like literally the alternative on their side is only mutual funds existing the problem with that that is simple like there is less transparency in how these funds invest which means there is less call out and which means that there is like lesser ability for people to actually know what the fuck is happening with their money which means these mutual funds can just run the economy the way they want like the like the way they did in the 2008 crisis right but i think second on information we are the only side which give you why people why people will now likely to be able to receive information better because like so, like given that the culture is retail investing there are more youtube videos of people telling you how to invest there are like more condensed bits of information coming on your instagram there are more like better graphs for people to be able to comprehend incentive more given given that then the only metric for them is that people don't consent really into investing because they don't have too much in go i just i've just proven to you why that is actively untrue but i think like there are just like alternatives alternatives where you need to invest by where people don't need much info like you can just invest in like a already proven stock like a reliance in india or a google in in us so i don't know what the comparative is there right and i think but and i think last like all their benefits or like all their harms on risk just are increasingly more on their side of the house and that is the reason they don't engage with that premise and hence they lose out on the debate for all those reasons very proud to negate all right thank you up reply hi uh, i'm still audible right yep okay all right um starting my speech sorry timer starting my speech in 3 2 1 go i'm going to look at two issues in this reply speech the first is on the idea of consent because the problem with this proposition team is that the only way in which they can win the debate now is by proving that people absolutely do not have the ability to consent right i think there are like a couple of criteria that can be like useful for knowing whether people can consent or not first is do they have information to consent and secondly to the extent to which they do have some information do the harms that result from this consent are one that are severe or irreversible hence we should not allow this sort of consent right first on lack of information the win can for side proposition here is to say that in a vast majority of like overwhelming number of cases people are likely to take advice from strangers on the internet which is why their investment strategies are going to be bad i want you to consider three things three things which is why you can't give the debate to side proposition on this one it's vastly unresponsive to a content about why a platforms themselves have an incentive to provide you information because that's how they stay com- they they literally survive in the long run otherwise all the people lose money and they can't exist in the long run but b that governments have incentives to provide this information in a more democratized manner when they know that more and more of their population is investing in the stock markets there's literally no response to all of this which is what they needed to do if they wanted to outweigh this claim but secondly i think they also had to do the likelihood analysis that you would go to a stranger because like i think we posit a few things here we say that in the worst case where you do end up going to a stranger they fail once or twice you realize they're a fucking idiot so you don't go to them again and again i think we give you as to why there are better more easier sources of information like the app itself or just like youtube videos or like just generally more information that comes out of the internet etc so they never do the likelihood of why 
why most people are likely to be like like dude bros drinking their protein shake and investing this stock market while talking to other dude bros right like but thirdly right i think we already outweigh this claim which is that even in the worst case where people do end up taking this advice from like strangers we tell you most individuals don't because they feel the impact of this in a more proximate manner when they're losing their money they no longer want to take this advice from other individuals which is why there's an organic incentive to gravitate towards the more stable sorts of like more reliable sorts of information which is why on their win condition itself of people take advice from strangers on the internet they don't do sufficient legwork to show why this is true in the vast majority of cases which is why they can't win on lack of information right but even if you credit discredit two minutes of my reply till now they never proved to you as to why on the other side you have the ability to consent to information like literally we push from ina speech that mutual funds have non transparent strategies they never tell you what they are doing or where they are putting your money in so you can't consent to a mutual fund either on where they're investing so if you want to buy that they lose on their own metric anyway but the second metric for consent could be that the harms of this are severe and uh, irreversible the problem with them again is unresponsiveness because we tell you a lot of things which frankly go unresponded to which take the extreme claims out of the day we tell you that literally if you're a dude bro like like literally like put one button which is called stop loss say that i'm investing and i will will just go out of the market if it falls out of 10% right they literally don't tell you as to why you will lose all your money and go into depression when you have an option called stop loss built into every single app ever right but secondly we tell you as to why markets themselves have incentive to not do this right you can you have circuit breakers etc which stop trading on a uh, on a stock if it's what if it there's panic selling that's happening in the market so no one can trade whatsoever which is an organic incentive built into the market right but and no response to all our material but why governments have an incentive to regulate this market at all which means that they might regret certain worse forms of this market existing but we tell you why in a vast majority of cases the harms are not as severe as they posit hence we should not take away the agency from individuals to invest in these sorts of options and to the extent to which is there is a trend for it becoming better they don't tell you as to why this rising trend towards more regulation is one that's detrimental right i think on weighing on scale our impact is just far more massive because we allow the individuals to make massive gains out of the stock market we allow like we are stock we allow economies to be more stable because they aren't inherently prone to bubbles but finally i just want to look at their counterfactuals they say two things on counterfactual one is that mutual funds make better decisions because they're run by people with a financial degree this is insufficient analysis there are probably like like there is probably one person within the mutual fund with a degree from cornell who is out competed by everyone else they don't show you as to why having a degree necessarily means that better information right but the only mechanism here is that mutual funds have an incentive to compete guys where do they have a better incentive to compete where they are competing in a world where they are competing with retail investors as well or in a world they know that everyone's going to come to them we uh, we, we co-opt the incentive of competing right but they never respond to our analysis of why mutual funds are short termists because they are ones which are often judged by their performance in a quarter in a year as opposed to retail investors who 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 think think more long termist in nature the reason why we win the debate is we showed you as to why this choice is one that's exclusively valuable for retail investors and all their harms are like frankly pretty extreme and we take them out anyway proud to negate All right. Thank you very much. Go for reply, please. Well, oh, just confirming I can be seen and heard. Yep. Awesome. Starting my speech in three, two, one. I think that the bar that a firm that negative needs to jump over in order to win this debate is they need to prove that a typical retail investor makes a better decision than an established managed fund, which is the likely counterfactual for most of these people who are doing things like seeking out a return that is better than their savings account. The problem is that they never manage it because, of course, people are not supercomputers, and even a single person with a finance degree, again, will almost always tell you you should track a whole index. Do not try to predict the movements of a single stock within an economy or five stocks within an economy. First question then, is anyone actually making money on Robinhood? Aside from a line at reply that we get that people are making massive gains, we actually get no analysis from this team in the slightest to claim that people are making more money on Robinhood than they would by letting this money just sit in a savings account and collect nominal interest every year. They don't give you any reason to think that there's some sort of tremendous gain, some sort of fix that people can exploit. They give you no analysis on how much money people are actually making off of Robinhood, which means that I think we can win pretty clearly by saying that most people probably are not making much money on this because the incentives of these apps are to facilitate rapid anxiety dri driven trading because they make their money on transaction fees and they don't care if it goes up or down they say we say that they prey on addiction they prey on things like lights and ads and social integration and the way that the app makes noises or notifications in the exact same way that toddlers get addicted to candy crush unfortunately most people are not much more sophisticated when it comes to these types of apps and the way that they use them just like plenty of clever people get addicted to gambling 
Like, it's not about intelligence. We're not saying people are stupid. We're saying we are human beings and our brains are flawed. And that's unfortunate, but it does mean that these guys, I think, completely fail to make a, reason, a reasonable response. The counterfactual of a managed fund is something where you make a share of the profits as the manager or as an employer or as an employee, you get a bonus. This isn't one dude with a degree from Cornell in his basement moving numbers around. This is teams of thousands of highly experienced people who have access to things like supercomputers, who have access to things like a track record that they can show to investors like we make an average of five or ten percent returns a year far far better very clearly you cannot predict the movement in a single stock it would be better off to try to predict the movement of like a single bit of pollen in the air it is impossible it is driven by random things by a thousand different things that you cannot predict but you can predict the movement of something like an entire population or a large number of particles in the air all at once because of averaging out. And that is why something like an index fund, you actually just can't fuck it up. Like if you choose one, it's probably going to go up because entire economies usually go up, but individual stocks within them can bounce all over the place. Let's then talk about externalities. Even if some people are making money on Robinhood, we give you four distinct reasons as to why, no, three distinct reasons as to why they're still bad. They enable things like pump and dump schemes, which allow some people to lose quite a bit of money. Maybe it isn't even all of them to be very generous. Like maybe it is true that most money people are making some money on pump and dumps, but some people are being coerced into holding on for too long and they lose quite a bit. The second thing is that it takes away from people buying into managed funds, which means that those managed funds are going to start to die out if young people do not support them. And that is really bad because when you want to retire later and save for that, you will not have a good market to do that. You will only be in a market that that preys on short-termism and high risk, which you probably don't want to do when you're 40 or 50 and thinking about how you hate your job and you really want to retire. The third thing we tell you is that company incentives become worse and economies as a whole become worse because all of a sudden it's more about how close you are to Elon Musk when it comes to your share price and much less about whether the product you make is actually any good. The final thing that we say is that they give you here as a positive externality, their one claim is that this allows people to invest into startup companies one, startup companies usually aren't publicly traded, so it's unclear how that works, but also this wasn't a problem before Robinhood anyway. You have things like venture capitalists, bank loans, whatever. There are so many mechanisms. This is not the one that gets them there. When it comes to managed funds, people who are doing things like investing hours onto scrolling on Reddit would have the tools and would be accessing something like asking their bank if they didn't have the option of going to Robinhood because it had never risen and they didn't hear about it. Those options are way better. You cannot fuck it up because they're tracking a massive amount of stocks instead of five stocks that can bounce around unpredictably. So you don't need much knowledge to choose a good one here. You do need a tremendous supercomputer-like amount of knowledge to win on Robinhood. For that reason, most people make better investments on our side that they can actually consent to, and they do not get addicted to them in the destructive ways that they do to Robin Hood. For those reasons, proud to affirm. All right. Thank you all very much for that debate. Um, I'm not too sure what happens 